all these qualia, which I'll come to in a second. So now here are the shapes again. And I'd like to do a little experiment with you, if you may. Uh, I'd like you to take your hand and palm, and with the other hand. Now, you see, if I go like this, this is a scratch, meaningless scratch. You can do a little scratch, nothing. And I do the same thing now, but I express love. And you will feel the difference. Now, why don't you, could you try that, please? Take your hand in the other form, and first you do a little scratch, just without too much pressure, just, and then do the same, similar thing, similar thing. This time, express love. Could you do it? Did you do it? Anybody couldn't do it? Did that? So now, would you please do it again, but do it better this time? Okay? Do it better. Go ahead. Did you do it better? How many of you did? Better, hold up your hand. Okay, many of you. How did you know how to do it better? <laughs> you have to discover it yourself, right? It's inside you, it's yours. It's there all the time. But we forget it. Now we did something interesting. We converted the shape of touch for taking emotion to sound that we expect would express the same emotion. We had to convert it in both the frequency and the amplitude of the sound according to the shapes. And if you did that, you got a sound that related to the touch expression. And then we tested these sounds on, on subjects to see if they could recognize the feeling in that sound that was made from touch, transformed from touch. And they did very well. They did this with a group of uh, uh, students at MIT and some students at, uh, in Australia at the New South Wales University medical students from California. Um, and uh, they, there was some, confu some, some confusion there. They didn't do so well between the uh, reverence and love with some confusion. But anger, heat, joy, grief were all very, very well, very well recognized from the sound, from the sound of that sound made from the touch. A completely different person, different so-called. Then we tested this also with the, uh, Australian Aboriginals who went to the central Abor Australia where there's a reservation on which I live uh, about a couple thousand of Aboriginal people under abominable, abominable conditions and who, who don't speak English, who speak their own language, Walbury Wal language. And this is a sign, on, this is north, 200 miles north from Alice Springs, which is more or less central Australia. And this is this sort of a desert, uh, red, red dust and red dirt. And they, they live in these shanties, like this. This is, this is uh, humpies, they call them in Australia, humpies. 
that they're doing our tests. They were very interested in, in the tests. They were really, especially the men, were some of the photographs we have, but not here, show, but they had expressions on like a, almost like a Harvard professor <laughs> listening to these sounds and with great interest and intentness. And uh, while they lived in this condition, the dog uh, as a road, you had to have a, a four-wheeled drive vehicle. I, w I was very depressed when I was there for my assistant, uh, Janice Walker. If it wasn't for her, we couldn't have done this, this work. She, was, uh, she maintained her ability to function. I did. I was so upset <coughs> by this. And so we did it and completed it. And this is how they did with a sound, emotionally expressive sound, made from the touch expression of a white urban person. See? So this is uh, how they did it. You see, they did just as well as the medical students in Australia and the students at Berkeley and MIT, whatever students I, I had this tested on at the time. It was quite a large group. And we're, we're there, we had to have, of course, uh, interpreters to the Aboriginal people because they didn't speak English. So we had to have, we had to have two different interpreters, one for the, for the male subjects and one for the female because there was sex in this and uh, they, would, they wouldn't, it, it didn't work unless you had a male and a female interpreter separately. We did that. And uh, the scores actually were not uh, significantly different between male and female, but all heard this well. So we, at this, uh, we have suggested that the same sensing forms communicate by various modes of output in sound, various output modalities, I should have said, in sound, in gesture, and in touch. It's more primary in the brain than any one of those modes. The, another thing is that these forms are contagious, as we know laughter and yawning to be. Now, everybody knows laughter. Uh, sometimes I said to people, if I go to school, in seventh, in, in, in third grade, we'll teach you how to laugh. And uh, part of the second semester of the school, first time, first week, we'll teach you to say, ha, ha, and you can do that well. And the next week, you can do ha, 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 and then three, after that, ha, 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 and soon you'll be able to laugh. Well, that's not how it is, is it? No. A child learns to laugh without being taught. You can't teach. You can't teach love. Why? Why can't you? Because it's an innate thing. And it's innate in connection with the feeling. You can neither teach the feeling nor the pattern. They go together like this. You can't separate them. You can suppress them, but you can't in their own nature separate them. And no one knows why laughter has that form. You could, somebody coming from a distant galaxy, um, another being, and you see a group of people here laughing, you know, as you often can do, or somebody tells a joke or whatever it is, they all laugh. Say, what are these people doing? What are they doing? <laughs> what is it? What is it they're doing? Oh, they, they're laughing. They, don't you know laughing? 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 What's that? Can you explain? No, you cannot explain. But why can't you explain? Because, because it's a qualia. Uh, I'll come to that in a second. 